Hi, welcome to Limnology. Today we're going to review food webs and food chains just to get everyone on the same page and then we're going to get more into bacteria and microbial food webs. So um, let's start out and uh, do our basic ecological review here. Most of you know this, but there are a few people who are not biologists in the class. So we're going to talk about uh, food chain terminology. So all of our food chains on Earth are driven by some kind of energy uh, source, and generally that's the sun, um, and they also need nutrients. And so our fuel here is, is listed, and then we go to our primary producers that are able to take uh, inorganic materials like nutrients and carbon dioxide and use that energy to produce organic materials. And so in, we call these primary producers, and that's the first trophic level. And examples of those in aquatic food webs would be phytoplankton. You might be able to think of some others say macrophytes, and then those primary producers are eaten by what we technically call primary consumers. Um, casually we might call these herbivores. This is the second trophic level, um, and a good example of those in the open water food web would be herbivorous zooplankton that are eating our phytoplankton, so something like this Daphnia here. And then those guys are consumed by secondary consumers, um, and we call that trophic level three. And examples of these are planktivorous fish, um, like this stickleback here, um, or predatory zooplankton. So not all zooplankton are herbivores, so something like this native Leptodora, this very diaphanous, transparent zooplankton that's shown here would be a predator of other zooplankton and a secondary consumer on the third trophic level. And then these, Predators here are consumed by other predators, and these are called tertiary consumers, and that would be the fourth trophic level, and this would be something like a fish-eating fish, a piscivorous fish, like this guy here. And then you might get even a top predator beyond that in some systems that ate piscivorous fish, and that would be trophic level five. And so trophic levels then formally can be defined as um, groups of functionally similar organisms that are basically consuming the same food resources. And individual species within those trophic levels may be competitors. So they may be vying for the same prey. Uh, so for example, you might have two different kinds of herbivorous zooplankton. Uh, we talked about Daphnia and Bosmina, and they may both be vying for phytoplankton prey, and those would be members of the same trophic level. And we can define trophic dynamics, which we mentioned briefly at the beginning of class as movement of energy from one part of this food web to another. So how much energy is transferred from primary producers to herbivores and so forth. And you may have seen in ecology in previous classes this formally um, diagrammed in a di uh, odom diagram like this or other diagrams where we can take our solar energy and we can measure our fluxes of that into our primary producers, some energy loss from those and fluxes into herbivores and carnivores and so forth. And then as everything dies, it gets decomposed and we have available nutrients again. So you can quantify these fluxes. And what you would quantify if you're trying to examine those uh, transfers between trophic levels is several things. First, simply you might say, if we have two different organisms in a lake or a pond or a wetland, is there actually a feeding relationship between them? Does one of them eat the other thing? Um, and that's an all or none response. We call that connectance. There's either an uh, arrow drawn between them, in which case one is eating the other, or they don't consume each other, in which case there's no arrow drawn. You'll see an example of a connectance web uh, later in the lecture. And we also could, however, try to more quantify the linkages. And there are several ways that we could quantify the material or the energy flow between components of our little food chain or food web. Um, and some of the things that we might quantify would be the calories that are transferred between one group and the other. Um, you may do this if you're on a diet. You may be thinking of the calories in your food that you're eating and you get it off the product label. Um, by the same measure, we could say, look at a fish and the fish's diet and say how many calories are in the prey that it's consuming. And that could be the, the way that we measure um, the quantity of material that's moving in that flux. So it's a measure of energy flow. We could also look at the element or nutrient components of that food. So we could say how much carbon was in that diet or how much nitrogen was in that diet. 
we could just look at the amount of dry material or the weight essentially, the dry mass that they are consuming. And that's the easiest. So a lot of people look at dry mass of food, the milligrams of food consumed, um, not because that's necessarily the best currency, but because it's really easy to have a balance and weigh the material that was in a diet. It's a little harder to be able to take something like uh, the device is called a Bob calorimeter where you sort of blast the food and look at how many calories were in it, how much energy was in it, or to be able to quantify carbon or nitrogen with an elemental analyzer. And then for some other materials, people will look at the amount of what's called ash-free dry weight. This is if you take the food and you combust it um, at over 500 degrees centigrade, so essentially you're, you're um, actually blasting away, volatilizing all of the organic material. And then you're leaving just the minerals behind. And so you know the weight of the organic flesh that was uh, consumed um, versus the amount of, of uh, minerals that may be non-digestible that were consumed. And this is especially important in prey items that might have uh, very um, high quantities of non-digestible material. So something like a mollusk, if you were eating a snail, um, you're not gonna get a lot of nutritional value from the shell of the snail. That would be part of what would be left behind in the ash. Um, and so that would give you an estimate of just how much of the snail's biomass was eaten if you were eating escargot, say. And uh, then diatoms, you guys learned about diatom algae. They have this uh, silicious frustule, this glass case that they live in. And that gl glass case is also not very digestible or nutritious for the predator. So you might use those measures then. So there's a limitation to all of those measures. Um, and as we start talking more about food webs and general ecology um, at, in the course, uh, one of those will keep coming up and that's the potential limit of food quality. And just like if you were looking at your diet in terms of calories and you went out and you're saying, oh, I wanna eat 1200 calories a day and you did that all in candy bars, um, that wouldn't be as nutritious a diet for you as eating a balanced diet. You get the same amount of energy, but it might not be um, as healthy in other ways. Um, it's the same with natural food that organisms would eat. So the different types of prey items, different algae, different macrophytes might differ in their vitamins or nutrients or essential fatty acids. And so we're not accounting for any of that food quality in these basic measures. And we'll discuss those limitations implications later in the class. So we can sort of summarize this. We have our energy that's trans transferred between these trophic levels, and we can think about the energy transfer and summation of transfer for each different trophic level. And we can say how much of the solar energy that comes in is actually taken up by primary produ producers versus is not. Um, and that's actually very small, often much less than 1% of solar energy is actually used to drive primary production in food webs. And then we can say how much of the primary producer material is actually utilized by consumers and how much is not. And that's actually pretty small. 5% uh, of that material is used, so 95% is not. Um, and then uh, about 15% of the energy is transferred from primary consumers to secondary consumers. And you may have learned in basic ecology that on average, every trophic level ha gets about 10% transfer efficiency between these links. Um, and that's something that you generally learn in ecology texts, um, and it's one of those cases where everything's a little bit simplified in intro bio and ecology. Um, you can think about why might it be that there's less efficiency of transfer of energy and material between primary producers and herbivores than there is between herbivores and carnivores. So a lot of the answer lies in the fact that you're trying to convert plant material into animal material at this link versus animal material into animal material. And that's just much more efficient transfer. You're not having to do as much uh, energetic transfer of materials between um, different kinds of compounds. And also there may be a lot of indigestible material in some of the primary producers. And so we'll be discussing some of those later. So the efficiency isn't exactly the same at every link. So we can measure those as the change in energy content between trophic level um, that's higher and the trophic level that's lower. Um, and those losses um, at each level are due to metabolism, losses as heat, and we get this increase in transfer efficiency as you move up the chain. So think about the reasons of, for those increased trophic transfer efficiencies and we'll be discussing them more as we go through the course. So 
when we try to manage aquatic systems, there often are different ways that we might manage a system in terms of trying to say control an algal bloom. And so there have been debates in the literature that we'll be discussing more as to whether it's easier to manage the system from the bottom of the system, from the nutrient end, or it is to manage the system from the top of the system, from say top predators and altering the food web dynamics. And uh, the answer is probably that there's not either or, but it's good to learn the general terminology and we'll discuss some specific examples during the management part of the class at the end. So let's go through the two different halves, bottom up versus top down. So bottom up control will be management from the bottom of this food chain. So we go from managing, say, the nutrient level to control the a number or, or the biomass of these organisms. And so the idea would be if we, could, if we increased our nutrients, then we would be able to increase, say, our algae, our primary producers. That might cause increased numbers of zooplankton or bivar zooplankton. That might might cause, because there's more food, increased numbers of their predators, and that might cause increased numbers of fish. So one way that you might control, say, the, the algal blooms is to reduce nutrients, or if you want to grow more fish, maybe you should add more nutrients by, based on bottom-up control. The other end of the spectrum would be top-down control. And the idea here would be that perhaps the predation is really a structuring uh, force. And then if we think about that, we might want to manage based on the top of the food web or the food chain in this case. And this is sometimes also called an odd even link paradigm or a sawtooth paradigm, as you'll see in a second. So if we say added top predators to the system, we added some nice piscivorous fish that some of you guys like to fish for, then those would eat the forage fish, the secondary consumers, and that would free the zooplankton from their predators. The forage fish eat the zooplankton, that would free them from their predators, so the zooplankton would increase. And if we have a lot of zooplankton, then maybe they could graze down the algae, be set, sort of like putting more sheep in a field and getting less grass in the field. And so that would reduce the algae that way. Um, and that might even then increase nutrients, but it's not, it's not always clear. So these two different ways of operating, uh, I should just go back for a second here. You can see the sawtooth paradigm could be because this is creating an up-down biomass and also we can have odd even link because if this is link one and this is link three they're going down and if this is link two and four they're going up so they have opposite directions and it's also called cascading effects because you cascade from the top to the bottom. So if we're doing those things, we can maybe affect the food web just by doing something that's a little more simple than reducing nutrients, like increasing piscivores or top predator fish. And so we'll discuss uh, all these management implications really in depth later in the class. Um, so there are other things that you learned about in ecology that sort of are linked to this topic of top-down control. And one of those is the concept of keystone species. And some of you may uh, know some of the classic keystone species where the this was first proposed. We're in the intertidal zone. Um, and the idea of a keystone species is that if you have, say, an arch, and you just took this keystone out of the arch, that one stone, even though it's a small part of the arch, by taking it out of the arch, you would collapse the arch. And so the idea is that you could have one species that might not be a major part of the biomass of species, and that could be removed um, and have a really big effect. So a keystone species, you couldn't remove it from the system, even if it's not a large number of individuals in your system, without having a big change in the community. And so some of you guys, if you think about what you learned in basic ecology, or if you think about marine ecology, may remember that the classic keystone species um, was the Pisaster starfish um, that preferentially fed on these blue mussels that were dominating the intertidal zone. Um, similarly, in freshwater systems and in open water systems, we have um, some proposed keystone species, things like those piscivorous fish, which may not be very abundant, but may change all the rest of the players. And also uh, one of the zooplankton, uh, Daphnia, a really large bodied zooplankton that we'll be discussing more in zooplankton ecology and in food web management is considered a keystone player because of its ability um, to consume large quantities of algae of a large size range.
So most often we think not just of food chains, those combining of links of organisms on the same uh, feeding level, but we also think of making food webs, these diagrams where you have um, boxes or pictures of the different organisms. Sometimes they're combined together into similar functional feeding groups, um, and you draw the links, the connectance links between them. And sometimes you can tell as much about the person who made the food web by looking at it, what they thought was important. So say in this stream food food web. We have a lot of fish diagrammed here and a lot of different macroinvertebrates and this is someone who was interested in those interactions and then all of the um, algae, benthic algae, paraphyton are put into one pool. There aren't even bacteria in this food web. But this tells you the feeding relationships. These fish are eating these, these paraphyton the, and, and some of these macroinvertebrates, for example. This food was, web was made by someone, you can guess, maybe interested in the zooplankton. And they've actually combined several different uh, trophic levels here, algae, primary producers, along with microbes and even dead material into one box. And all fish are in the same box. So it's important to realize that any of these diagrams is a simplification of the actual pattern in nature and the way people may choose to draw the food web or which links to quantify may be more a function of the kinds of questions they're interested in answering and it can be very, very laborious to quantify all these links. So choosing particular links and particular parts of the food web to focus on can be important for answering certain questions. So these food webs may be pretty idiosyncratic based on the question and they may not encompass the whole, um, the whole lake or the whole pond or the whole stream. There are some attempts to quantify everything or at least measure all of the links. Um, and then this is a, an attempt to show all of the main players. Um, this nice uh, sort of connectance food web of this well-studied lake in Wisconsin, uh, part of the Wisconsin uh, LTER that we've been talking about, long-term research site. And you can see here um, that we have different top predator fish and other fish. These dots are the species, these little balls. And the little sort of string lines in between them are connectance links. So this isn't telling us how much energy is transferring between this or material. It's just saying this species eats that species and all the other ones that are tied to it below hand. Um, and so these would be the primary producers, the herbivores, um, the secondary uh, consumers or the third trophic level and so forth. And so you can see that there are lots and lots of connectance links, just feeding links between them. They identified 997 feeding links among 92 taxa just in this small lake in Wisconsin. Um, so these, drawing these kinds of diagrams and making them into mathematical models might tell you a bit and start you getting to be able to quantify questions such as if we took this guy out of the food web, what would happen? You know, what would happen if we altered this base of the food web? So these food chains become more complicated and transfer, transformed into food webs, not just because we may connect all of the different components and show all of the species that are present and their feeding relationships, but also because species don't act as one type of organism all the time, and they may not be constrained to be just herbivores or just predators. And that's sort of common sense. We know that because we ourselves are not just herbivores or not just carnivores. Most of us as humans are omnivores and eat both meat and veg vegetable material. And so omnivory is formally in ecology, um, eating at several trophic levels. It's not just eating multiple types of food. Um, so you might think of yourself as an omnivore, uh, even if you just consumed, uh, uh, if you were vegetarian and just consumed veg vegetable material and plant material. Um, but actually, ecologically, in a, a scientific sense, so you wouldn't be an omnivore unless you ate at several trophic levels. Um, so if you ate mushrooms and vegetables, you could be an omnivore because you would be eating decomposed and autotrophs. So omnivory is formally feeding on several trophic levels at once. Um, it used to be thought that this was somewhat rare, um, but it turns out it's really pretty common. Um, and some primary producers in aquatic systems are 
uh, omnivores. They photosynthesize and they consume materials. And we call that mixotrophy or having a mixed feeding strategy. And this is a dinoflagellate, um, a kind of primary producer you guys have learned about and will learn more about. And a lot of dinoflagellates not only photosynthesize, but can also consume bacteria, dissolved organic matter. Um, and so these are mixotrophs. Uh, so even the primary producers in aquatic systems can uh, be at several different uh, trophic levels at once. Uh, you may be able to think of some terrestrial plants that that's true of. We mentioned a few in the bog system, say pitcher plants, that are primary producers but eat insects. Um, and in addition, we get predators that sometimes don't just consume algae, phyto, uh, that don't just consume uh, Carnival, uh, animals, such as a fish that doesn't just eat uh, zooplankton, but may eat macroalgae, or more often in north temperate systems, we might get uh, invertebrate predator um, that will eat uh, other invertebrates, but also will eat flagellated algae. So it's acting as a predator and an herbivore. And it's thought that, that omnivory is probably more common in terrestrial systems, uh, in, in aquatic systems, than in terrestrial systems, where you might get more strict herbivores and strict carnivores. Another reason that the food webs get pretty complicated is that as organisms uh, grow up and mature, they can often change their diet pretty radically. So these are two images. This one is of a juvenile copepod called Anopleus, um, and this one is of an adult copepod. You can see the little egg sacs of the adult, um, and these will hatch these eggs and turn into this guy. And as a juvenile, um, they're eating uh, algae. The gut here is a little bit green because of the algae that they're consuming. And as adults, uh, many of these uh, cyclopoid copepods are carnivores. You can see the gut here is brown from eating animal material. And some are omnivores. They'll eat both, an both small zooplankton and they will eat um, phytoplankton. So that means that if you were going to categorize this copepod as being on a certain trophic level, you'd have to put the, the juvenile form in a different bucket, in a different trophic level than the adult form. In addition, a lot of organisms don't eat the same thing year round. Um, and so, especially you might be familiar with fish being able to switch their diet as prey become more available. Um, and so they may be eating at one trophic level uh, during one season and another trophic level during another season as different prey become more available. And that can cause this simple uh, food web, food chain to become much more complicated. One thing that's interesting when we compare um, aquatic and terrestrial systems is that in general, organisms at each trophic level in aquatic systems are larger than those at the previous level. And that's not necessarily true in terrestrial systems where you might get something um, like a wolf that's eating a much bigger um, terrestrial prey item here. Generally, you have this rule that in aquatic systems, if something's going to eat something else, it has to be able to swallow it whole. Um, on terrestrial systems, you can get predators that are going to take down uh, their prey item and they're able to have it rest on the ground and devour it, um, and they have cheeks so the food isn't falling out of their mouths. Um, whereas in uh, aquatic systems, um, if a fish consumes uh, another fish, it pretty much generally will swallow it whole. If it just took a chunk out of it, the prey might swim away, it might fall to the bottom where it couldn't get to it. Um, and most of our aquatic uh, organisms don't have good cheeks, they're really sloppy feeders and the material is lost. Um, and so most organisms are consumed by things larger than them. That's a nice, easy rule of thumb if you're thinking about trying to give a rough estimate of an organism you don't know. Is it predatory or herbivorous? Often the smaller it is, the more likely it is to be herbivorous. The bigger it is, it's more likely to be predatory. Also, if you're uh, swimming around a lake or ocean, you're much more likely to be in danger from a large shark or something. And sharks are an exception, actually, that rule, because they will take bites out of a prey that's bigger than them. Uh, but you're much more likely to be in in mortal danger of a larger predator than you are of a smaller predator. Uh, whereas on land, there are plenty of smaller things that can do you in and uh, consume you. So it's a nice way to think about that. So we have this body chain, body size rule in aquatic systems. So 
We're going to talk today more about the microbial loop part of the food web. The little tiny decomposers um, that were traditionally thought of as decomposers, the microorganisms in the food web. Um, and a lot of these things weren't studied historically just because it was hard to do that. You may remember back to the first class when we talked about Ray Lindemann who had developed these ideas of trophic levels, primary producers, both the pelagic phytoplankton and our macrophytes, and we had zooplankton and invertebrate uh, macroinvertebrates as herbivores, and we have plankton predators and benthic predators as the third trophic level, and we have swimming predators above that. And he put bacteria and ooze, all the detritus, um, right in the middle of this little food web, right from the beginning, and knew that there was a sort of separate pelagic and benthic system, and that these were all connected. Um, but since then, for a long time, until about the last two or three decades, there was a lack of, of integration. So after the 40s, we had, you know, 50 years or so of ignoring the microbial loop. Um, and understanding the microbial loop has really increased our uh, complexity of our food web. Um, we talked about how with the carbon cycle, most of the carbon in a lake or a pond is in dissolved organic carbon, um, or say most of the phosphorus might be in organisms. Um, and so most of the carbon is not in organisms. Most of the organic carbon is dissolved in the water, and that's the food of the microbial loop, is that organic material. So what is the microbial loop? We've been looking at this grazer chain when we've been talking about our general sort of classic food chains from going from nutrients and, and, and sunlight through algae, through zooplankton, through fish. That, that would be called the grazer chain, things eating each other. Um, but the microbial loop is this part here. Sorry, I'm not good at drawing. This part of the, food, of the food web where we basically have bacteria that are consuming organic matter. They might be decomposing dead material. They're eaten by various kind of microscopic organisms that are in turn eaten by other microscopic organisms. And then these things release dissolved organic material. So this might function as its own separate loop, the microbial loop, or is it linked to the rest of the grazer chain, stuff that most of you guys tend to care more about. Like you might want to just harvest fish. Maybe you can ignore all these things or are they linked in there? If you care about the metabolism of the lake or the wetland, then these guys, this bacterial loop, this microbial loop is going to be interesting to you no matter what. But if you care about just fish, is that really important? So we'll try to answer that question, talk more about the microbes. And one of the cool things that's happened in the past 10 years in research on microbial loops is that we've realized that that mixotrophy of algae eating things like dissolved organic matter and bacteria is one loop here, one link between the microbial loop and the grazer chain. And so some zooplankton can eat these bigger members of the microbial loop. And that viruses and some other organisms that are lysing these cells end up being big players in making nutrients available to algae. So those are going to be some of the take-home messages that we're going to learn right now. So the general quote that uh, I've heard some microbial ecologists say is that microbes can do anything they want wherever they want um, and without microbes humans wouldn't be alive. So I'm not sure they can do anything they want. They probably uh, couldn't uh, teach you about the microbial loop for example, um, but it is the case that without microbes, humans wouldn't be alive. We actually have more um, microbial cells in our body than we do human cells. So the bacteria are sort of the key players in our microbial uh, loop, and there are two major groups of uh, bacteria. The true bacteria, or eubacteria, which is most of the common bacteria things like E. coli in your gut, or the cyanobacteria that we've talked about as phytoplankton, primary producers in systems. And about uh, 30, 35 years ago, um, archaea were discovered, or archaebacteria, a whole new group of uh, bacteria. And uh, these were first found in inhospitable conditions, like deep sea vents. Uh, but now people are realizing with the advent of uh, better genetic technology that they're all over the place. They're really common in lakes and streams and wetlands. And 
the difference, even though these are tiny and it's sometimes hard for us as large terrestrial vertebrates to really relate to these tiny things in the food web, um, genetically these guys are more different from each other than plants are from animals. So even though they're both tiny microbe, ca microbial groups, um, they really have a lot of differences that we're not going to get into here. Uh, but if you take microbial ecology, you'll learn a lot more about the key differences between these major groups of bacteria. So all bacteria are uh, prokaryotic. You guys learned this in general biology or in high school, which means, again, they don't have organelles. They have naked DNA. It's not in an organized nucleus. And they don't have um, organelles like mitochondria, obviously, or chlor chloroplasts. So uh, in fact, as we'll talk about in phytoplankton ecology, the organelles are derived from bacteria that were engulfed by other organisms. Um, so just a general review of what that is. So bacteria are going to be tiny. Um, they're generally less than one micron in length, often much less than that, uh, although they can range from 0.1 to 5 microns, um, and they're prokaryotic. And they have a lot of um, interesting uh, characteristics. They can tolerate living in a huge range of places. Uh, this guy is actually carrying a little probe to sample, uh, not doing anything untoward in that picture. Um, and they can live in boiling water. They can live in frozen sediment. They can live in acidic water, acidic volcanoes, like the uh, acidic volcano with sulfur, pure sulfur floating on the surface that we discussed earlier in class. Um, they can live deep in rocks. They can live in the deep ocean. They have resting stages that can survive for very long periods of time and even in space. So they're sort of amazing. And they can have a really fast generation time. So they may reproduce as quickly and, and divide as quickly as 20 minutes if conditions are great. And they can also alternatively survive and be viable, um, able to reproduce again um, for centuries without reproducing. And the average generation time, if you went to your lake in the middle of the summer, the average bacterium would be um, reproducing or dividing about once a day, just to give you a general scale. So um, cyanobacteria that we'll discuss more in the phytoplankton section uh, were the first uh, photosynthetic organisms on ancient Earth, as far as we can tell. And that was actually responsible for the buildup of oxygen in the atmosphere. So there's a good reason to say that without bacteria, we wouldn't be alive. Uh, the primitive Earth did not have oxygen in the atmosphere. And for them, oxygen was just a waste product of their photosynthetic process. So we can thank cyanobacteria for aerobic respiration and all those other redox reactions we talked about. Um, some bacteria can move. They're not just stationary cells. Um, some of them actually have flagella that have a rotary motor, which is sort of cool, and they can spin pretty quickly. Um, revolutions, 100 revolutions per second, which is 6,000 RPMs, which is pretty impressive if you think about how fast something is turning. And in the scope of the tiny scale of a bacterium, um, they can move pretty quickly, so 10 times their body length per second. You also might want to think about why you might want a rotary motor and a corkscrew action for something tiny to move. And think back to Reynolds numbers and the ability to propel yourself through a viscous material and how a corkscrew uh, propeller might be better uh, than a simple sort of flapping motion of fish. Uh, we'll get more into that in other parts of the class again. But think about, remember, these guys are living at low Reynolds numbers in viscous fluids for them at their small, small body size. So for a long time, microbial ecology was really, really simple. Um, people divided bacteria into different categories based on their shape. Uh, they might be rods, they might be um, round, they might be filaments or based on the proteins on their surface, so whether those tested positive or negative to being stained by a gram stain. Um, and really, the past two decades have seen the advent of amazing specific probes where people can assay um, the genetic uh, material of the whole community of microorganisms. And they can have specific assays to see if they're doing different processes. So are they doing various kinds of the redox reactions we talked about? Are they using specific substrates? Uh, what's, what is the community dominated by? I'm able to use that technology um, to compare different lakes and different regions.
So Farouk Azamu is one of the pioneers of aquatic microbial ecology, wrote a classic paper um, that's cited in your handout, the ecological role of water column microbes in the sea in the early 80s in the marine ecology uh, progress series. And he had a great quote there which said, the study of microbial ecology has until recently been pursued either by visionaries or by fools. And essentially what he meant by that was that um, essentially what he meant by that was that um, if you were going to be studying microbial ecology with the techniques that they had in the early 80s, you were going to be limited to a really small set of questions. Um, however, if you were thinking about the importance of microbes in the system, there were plenty of reasons to think that microbes might be really important in recycling nutrients and doing various other kinds of processes. And so you might be a visionary to realize that microbes were probably playing a big role in the ecology of lakes and oceans. But you would also be a bit of a fool because it was so hard to study them. Um, so why was it so hard? Well, at that time, even bacteria counting was done in a way that was really underestimating um, bacterial numbers. It was only right before this paper was published in the 70s that we were able to quantify them well. So how was that done? So initially, the old plating techniques were used to grow bacteria. So you take a, a aliquot of seawater or lake water and you put it on a plate, a petri dish that had various nutrients, and then you would put that in an incubator and see how many colonies grew. And there's a nice uh, little diagram, a little example here of a plate that shows a number of different um, organisms that have grown into colonies on the petri dish. And then you would enumerate these and say, okay, that's the number of bacteria that we have. And so people estimated through the early 1970s that in every milliliter liter of lake or seawater, you might get 100 or 1,000 bacteria in a milliliter. Um, but it turns out that only 1 to 2 percent, if not fewer, of natural bacteria in lakes and seawater can be cultured. And so actually what you find is that there are about a million bacteria in every mill of seawater. And the way people figured this out is they got stains um, that were able to fluoresce um, and they intercalated or mixed in with the nucleic acids. And then in the dark under a scope, a compound scope, you could see these little tiny dots, basically like counting stars in the sky. And you could count the number of dots, see those bacteria, they were revealed visually. Um, and you could actually count all that were there. You weren't relying on them actually being able to grow in the lab. You were just relying on being able to sustain them and count them. Seems like a basic thing to do if you want to study them. So there are tons of them. And there are about a million per mil. Um, so that's about a thousand times more um, than were thought with the plating techniques, a hundred to a thousand times more. And in the sediments on average of a lake, uh, you get about uh, a billion uh, bacteria, 10 to the ninth uh, per mil in, in the sediments. Um, you get a few more in productive lakes than unproductive lakes, but it's still about a million. So you could uh, bet your friends uh, that you're going to go out to Onondaga Lake and take a milliliter of lake water and you're going to find a million bacteria, uh, you know, something between half a million and nine million, and you'll make some money if you get them to take it off and uh, take you up on it because almost always you're going to be right with that. The numbers are really pretty constant. So you go from lake to lake, river to river, um, and you're going to find almost always about this million bacteria per milliliter. Don't think about that if you ingest water uh, while you're swimming, although uh, most of these, as you're going to see, are not harmful. And so one basic question was, why is that always about the same? Um, and there are many answers, including uh, that there's some limitation of bacterial growth and things are eating them, uh, but still we don't fully understand why that number would equalize out to be a million uh, per mil. So it's a nice little mystery maybe you'll solve. And we tend to see some patterns of seasonal uh, abundance of bacteria. So here's a good example from a north temperate lake and you can see it going from 1980 to 87. They quantified the bacteria through each growing season. There were fewer in the winter, about a million per mil. And then there were more in the summer with a few peaks and valleys. And then they decreased in the winter. And you had this occur year after year, but always between one and, and, uh, one and, and uh, nine million bacteria per mil. So, we might think, well, the numbers, you guys know we've been harping on how biomass and numbers aren't necessarily as important as growth rates and rates. So 
People also started to be able to quantify how fast bacteria were growing, how fast bacteria were taking up materials. And most often they started doing that with radioactive materials. So they would label an organic material like a sugar or a protein with radioactive carbon or radioactive hydrogen. And then they would put that into a sample of water and see how rapidly the bacteria took up that radioactive material to give them an idea of how fast they were taking up organic compounds of different kinds and then they could see how fast they were growing. Um, they are also able to use specific probes and assays to see which bacteria are most active. Are the ones that are feeding on certain kinds of substrates more active than others? Are sulfate reducers more active than nitrate reducers and so forth? Um, and what they found was a lot of the bacteria that you find as cells there in the water sample that you count as those dots in the sky um, are not active at any given time. They're sort of senescent. And so those ghost cells or those non-active cells, which is appropriate for this time of year at Halloween, um, can be about 20 to 90 percent of the a number of total cells that you're able to count using those epifluorescent techniques. And the more active bacteria generally, the more um, organic matter is in the water, so sort of the more food that's available. We talked about estuaries having a lot of nutrients and organic material. They tend to have the most percentage of active bacteria. Um, lakes are then next most concentrated. They tend to have a lot of active bacteria uh, compared to uh, open water marine systems that are more dilute and streams and groundwater. So what are bacteria doing in the lake? There's a bunch of different ways for organisms to sort of make a living. Uh, you and I are heterotrophs, um, so we eat organic matter, like the food that you're eating is organic matter, and we also take the um, carbon and the nutrients from that organic matter to build our biomass, to build our bodies. And so we're heterotrophs, that's what heterotrophs do. Um, and green plants, terrestrial plants, are photoautotrophs. They're using light as energy and they're using inorganic carbon, carbon dioxide as the source of their uh, new plant material, say new leaves. There are a couple other ways that something might make a living as say chemoautotrophs. In this case they might get the energy source not from sun but from chemical energy, that's the chemo here. So reduced materials um, that have high energy in their uh, chemical bonds and they can use that energy as the source for making their energy currency or ATP. And then they're going to be able, they're autotrophs because they're able to use inorganic carbon to build their cell components. So something like the deep sea vent bacteria might be chemoautotrophs that you guys may have heard about at the bottom of the ocean. Um, and then we have photoheterotrophs, and these organisms are able to get energy from light, um, but they're also able to build their cells from organic matter in addition to inorganic matter. So bacteria actually can do all these things, whereas us and other animals can only be heterotrophs, and our green plants are predominantly photoautotrophs. Um, the bacteria that we find in natural systems can make a living in any of these ways. They have a, a diverse set of lifestyles. So autotrophic bacteria, um, both photo and chemoautotrophs, are going to be having a role in the lake um, or the, the stream of making organic matter. Um, and um, these include cyanobacteria that are often lumped in with phytoplankton, like the cephanozomenon, these clumps of, of photosynthetic algae that are shown here. Decomposers or mineralizers is sort of the traditional role that you guys learned about as the role of bacteria in lakes. And mineralizers are supposed to take dead material um, and they're supposed to release nutrients from that and they'll get some energy from that. And the traditional thing that you learn about in intro bio or ecology uh, or in high school would be that those minerals are then available for primary producers to use. So they're going to take the dead particulate organic matter or uh, stuff that's been lysed into the water and is dissolved organic matter, the DOM, and they're going to convert that back to um, carbon dioxide by metabolizing it and to inorganic nutrients that are available for plant growth.
Now it's true that bacteria are decomposers in the sense that they take dead material and they can use it for cell processes. Um, and so they are decomposers. Without bacteria in your lake or your stream, it would rapidly fill up with dead stuff and we wouldn't have a lake or stream anymore. However, this idea that those things are then going to be available, the nutrients are going to be available for primary producers to use, that's the part of that story that is something that is being questioned a bit now, that these bacteria actually are going to be keeping those, uh, those nutrients in order to produce new bacteria and that it is going to be other players that are going to kill the bacteria and release those nutrients, things like viruses, that are going to be responsible for remineralizing those, those elements from the bacteria. So they're decomposers, but whether they're mineralizers, releasing that stuff to primary producers is a little bit in doubt right now. So the dissolved organic carbon, as we've said, is much more abundant than the particles in, the, in lakes and in streams. And decomposition by bacteria, as you guys learn in the redox section, occurs faster with oxygen. Remember why that is? Aerobic respiration using oxygen as a terminal electron acceptor is much, much more energetically favorable. So overall in lakes and in estuaries, um, about a quarter to over a little over half of organic matter that's made in the water will settle out, die, settle out of the upper waters, the epilimnion, and it'll be decomposed in the sediments anaerobically, so pretty inefficiently. So between all of that different decomposition that occurs through the various redox pathways that we've mentioned earlier in class, the various decomposition pathways, the bacteria will release carbon dioxide as a function of respiration and methane to the atmosphere. So they're releasing some greenhouse gases to the atmosphere, um, but they're really essential for breaking down this organic matter. In addition, a lot of the nitrogen that comes into a lake that's nitrogen limited comes from specific kinds of microbes, uh, say like anabina, that have specialized cells that are able to take atmospheric nitrogen, as we mentioned, break that hard triple bond of nitrogen and put it into usable form. And we'll mention this again during phytoplankton part of the class. Um, occasionally bacteria are pathogenic. Most of us, if we think about bacteria, we think about, oh, bacterial diseases. Um, and there are some outbreaks. Um, for example, um, some kinds of bacteria will kill um, or aquatic organisms. Some of them may become important uh, pathogens to humans, like E. coli. Uh, but that's a really small percentage of the overall bacterial pool in a lake, the pool, so to speak. So we have a lot of bacteria in lakes, and most of them are not pathogens, but some are. And generally, pathogenic bacteria in lakes uh, for various kinds of organisms don't cause huge die-offs, but sometimes they do. And so especially Aeromonas, uh, killing perch. Uh, here we've got this uh, hole in the side disease caused by this Aeromonas. This is a white perch and you can see these nasty lesions caused by that bacterium um, that are these stained little rods here. And so you get all of these different types of bacteria. So what's controlling how fast they're growing or how active they are? Um, just like all living organisms, bacteria uh, growth is regulated by temperature and it's going to increase with increasing temperature up to some limiting point that may vary for different types of bacteria. But they're also limited by nutrients, it's not just by temperature. And here's where we need to go back and redefine two types of cellular processes. That of assimilation, where you're bringing elements into a cell and incorporating them into the cell. Uh, you can remember that if you're a Star Trek uh, fan by the Borg that were assimilating people into their collective, taking them in, forcing them in. If you're assimilating elements into the cell um, as a bacteria, you're, you're taking those from your food source into your biomass or your protoplasm. And they can also use their their organic matter food to take energy from. Um, and they don't have to take the carbon or the elements into their cell to make new biomass. So that would be breaking apart um, the food source um, and using the energy and the chemical bonds, but not assimilating the material into the bacteria itself. So in the first case, assimilation, you might have an organic material and the carbon becomes part of the bacterium. In the second, you have an organic material and it's just the energy from the chemical bond that the bacterium is using.
We also know that our dissolved organic matter that's floating around in a lake isn't just carbon, it includes carbon and nitrogen and phosphorus and other materials. And classically it was thought that bacteria were limited by this carbon. Um, and part of that is that bacteria are often thought to be better competitors um, than algae for inorganic nutrients. And you think, why would that be? What's controlling competition? Think for a second. They have to get that stuff from the water. And a lot of what's controlling it is the access to it. And if bacteria are smaller, they have higher surface area that's exposed to the water um, per volume of bacteria cells. So they should be able to grab more nutrients than a bigger algae would that has a lower surface area to volume. So if we think of our little green algae fighting our orange bacterium here for uh, the phosphorus that's in a dissolved organic material, um, then often we would think that bacteria should be able to get the phosphorus away from it because they should be in contact with a lot more of these molecules per surface area than the, than the algae. But they also do need those nutrients. And they do better, they grow better when they have organic material that's provided that is high in not just carbon but also has other essential elements like phosphorus and nitrogen. And there's been increasing demonstrations that bacteria can be nutrient limited, especially by phosphorus. So um, prokaryotic cells just have a little more phosphorus in them due to the structure of their ribosomes and a few other things. And so they require um, they require more phosphorus than do um, the phytoplankton and other eukaryotic cells. So if you just feed something, lignin or cellulose, that's really high in carbon, those bacteria don't grow as quickly as bacteria that are fed something with a more balanced elemental ratio uh, of, of available materials. So we call that um, balance or the, the material that would increase the growth rate of those of those organisms higher quality and so labile dissolved organic carbon is something that would be easily used taken up quickly often has more balanced nutrients relative to carbon whereas refractory material it's really hard to break down something like lignin or cellulose that's very difficult for the bacteria to break down and may not have as high nutrient content um, often in aquatic systems, ultraviolet light that we mentioned at the surface of lakes and streams helps to break down the organic material as well. Um, and that can make dissolved organic carbon more usable to bacteria. But it's also been shown that bacteria can be susceptible to ultraviolet radiation. So there's a trade-off in whether ultraviolet light is helpful to bacteria because it it helps uh, break down organic carbon into small, smaller, more usable bits, or if it's harmful because it uh, is able to cause some uh, genetic damage in bacteria, sort of like a bacterial sunburn. In general, the main source of good quality dissolved organic material for bacteria in lakes is from uh, stuff that's released out of phytoplankton. And phytoplankton themselves are photosynthesizing, but they're sort of leaky. Instead of thinking them as sort of a solid plastic bag, you can think of them as a little bit of a porous plastic bag that are leaking or exuding some material out of themselves. And so we tend to see a pattern as the chlorophyll A, which is indicator, as you guys know, of the amount of phy phytoplankton in a cell. So if we look here, as we go from low chlorophyll to high chlorophyll, we go from low algae to high algae, high phytoplankton. We tend to see, but again, within this small range, we tend to see increasing bacterial abundance, rarely below or above a million per mil. Um, but we, that's a function mostly of this, this amount of phytoplankton present because they're leaking this good quality dissolved organic matter. So um, up to half of the carbon that our phytoplankton fix in a lake that they're photosynthesizing can be leaked and used by bacteria. So it's quite a bit. And bacterial productivity tends to be about a quarter of the net primary productivity of algae on average, and about twice that of zooplankton. So it's also much higher than the productivity of, say, fish. So if we're going out to a lake or a stream, um, how are we going to know what's limiting bacterial growth? Um, generally, what we do is we basically do what's called a bioassay and we ask the bacteria themselves what is limiting you. We give them the water that's present and various other substrates. And if bacteria are limited by a substance in that water, they'll increase their growth rates by the addition of that substance.
So the bacteria often increase with increasing phosphorus, um, and this is a log, log scale. Um, and there's a complication there, right? You can think what else this doesn't necessarily mean. This is a good example of how correlation and causation may not be the same. You'd have to do some tests because by increasing the phosphorus, what else do you increase? You increase the primary production often. So some of this graph might be a function of direct phosphorus limitation of bacteria, but some of the graph is a function of phosphorus limitation of algae and the bacteria being fed better when they're more algae. So what controls the loss of bacteria from the system? If we're always going to have about a million bacteria, some of that may have a function of them not growing really, really quickly, but some of it may be a function of them being eaten down to a certain constant level. And who eats bacteria? Um, most of, of the consumers of bacteria, most of their predators are protozoans. And protozoans are a huge diverse group that you guys will learn more about in zooplankton. But they're single-celled, they're eukaryotic, so they have a true uh, nucleus, they have all the organelles. Um, and these are going to be heterotrophic organisms, um, and they're going to ingest um, these bacteria by um, engulfing them. They're going to be phagotrophic and bringing them into the cell, into vacuoles where they're going to digest them. So these little bacteria are going to be consumed and digested in this cell. And again, we'll discuss protozoans more later, but the, they can be amoeboid, uh, sort of moved by pseudopods. They can be ciliates and they can be flagellates. And flagellates and ciliates are really common in the open water of lakes. Um, so there may be 10 to 1,000, um, uh, I'm sorry, there may be 50 to 2,000 flagellates in a given uh, milliliter of water. Um, and these tend to be smaller than the ciliates, uh, which tend to have, say, between 1 and 100 per milliliter of water and be about 10 to 1,000 microns. We'll see a comparative size scale in a second. And they can be really voracious. So you think of these tiny little microbes, but flagellates can ingest um, per flagellate between 100 and 1,000 bacteria cells per day uh, if they're growing rapidly. And so that's quite a predation rate. So here we can see sort of a, a cartoon of the relative sizes of organisms. We've got viruses that we can't see. We'd have to clump together millions of them to make a visible particle. Then we've got bacteria. And then they can get consumed by these flagellates that are bigger than they are, and they can get consumed by these ciliates. And so you're looking at here 10 microns, which is about a, a third uh, to a quarter the, the width of a human hair uh, for scale. And these ciliates are really diverse. Some live in little houses like caddis flies do in terms of macroinvertebrates and streams in, in lake water, and we'll talk more about these guys later. Um, and until um, you know, the past couple decades, people didn't think they were necessarily really important consumers of the bacteria, and they hadn't demonstrated classic predator-prey cycles. Uh, but increasingly, people realized that if you get a bacterial bloom like this, that flagellates often increase in number, and then they're able to consume the bacteria enough to decrease their, their numbers. So you can get these predator-prey cycles. Um, these were really first observed in the 90s in some Arctic conditions. And you might think of why that could be because everything slowed down a bit in these cold systems, so it would be easier to observe them. You wouldn't have to be sampling really, really frequently to see these cycles the way you would in a really uh, uh, warmer, temperate zone lake. And the real key thing I'd say in the past decade is this idea that viruses are really important. There are a lot of natural viruses in, in water, right, a billion viruses. And these guys can uh, attack cyanobacteria. There may be uh, 10 to 100 million in every milliliter of water. Um, and these, these viruses naturally attack algae and they attack natural bacteria. And with technological advances, people have been able to visualize them like this. And they've also been able to look at their genetic material, determine if they're RNA viruses and DNA viruses and all kinds of other groupings, and look at the relationships between them. And 
the, the current work indicates that about half of all of the death of bacteria may actually be due to viruses. And so there's selective predation of bacteria by flagellates and ciliates. They'll grab certain kinds that are fast growing. But there's also selective death of bacteria by viruses that when the bacteria bloom, those viruses become more abundant and sort of give the bacterial flu uh, to, those, to that group of abundant bacteria and reduce their numbers. Um, they're also probably responsible for a significant portion of phytoplankton mortality too. So in addition to reducing bacterial numbers, think about what it would do to the contents of the cells to have viruses attacking the cell and lysing them, bursting them open. And that's where we say that bacteria may not be remineralizers, that viruses may be remineralizers because they're bursting the cell contents open and releasing those materials to the environment. Um, and uh, Suttle and Furman and others have really pioneered these areas of visualizing and characterizing the diversity of viruses and their ecological role and convincing aquatic scientists that these are very important. And a lot of you may think of, say, oceanography as an area where people would go study uh, dolphins and so forth, and that's definitely true. But those big charismatic organisms are actually being studied a bit less in many parts of oceanography today than are these microbial organisms because they're just so unknown and they probably play a really important role at the bottom of the food web in terms of releasing all of these nutrients and key materials and cycling of nutrients in our ocean provinces. So it's a really active area of aquatic research in both lakes and oceans. And we can do our typical um, northern temperate cycle of what's driving bacteria, the way we've done for mixing and nutrients and we'll do for phytoplankton and everything else. And we can go from January to December, so we're going through the winter stratified period and spring blooms and summer periods and fall mixing. And we can see that the, the, in this case, they've identified some of the major sources of mortality for the bacterial production. Um, they're getting fed by all the phytoplankton growth and exuding of material, um, and they're getting fed by um, the breaking of algal cells and release from grazing, but they're being killed off by viruses, they're being killed off by various kinds of ciliates, even Daphnia can eat some large bacteria, um, and these viruses and ciliates and other sources of mortality tend to keep their numbers down. So the bacterial production and numbers show these variable paths, um, but all staying within, say, one to nine million bacteria per mil. So they might have a bloom after the algal bloom and then have several different peaks as there's more material available for them to digest and several troughs as things like viruses eat them. So why are these microbes important to the lake? This is sort of cool from an academic sense, but we can ask several questions. Like, are bacteria actually food to something on the grazer chain that maybe your typical biologist would, uh, fisheries biologist would care about? And can bacteria really be nutrient regenerators or not? Um, there's a lot of bacterial production, but what happens to it? Is it just hanging out there and interesting to microbial ecologists or are other functions of the lake affected by it? Is it stuck in that microbial loop cycling or does some of the fish actually represent um, energy that came from bacteria originally? And so we could say like, is this grazer chain independent or what are the links between that and the microbial loop as we posed at the beginning of class? And so, these algae tend to be really key players, as we hinted at the beginning, because they're taking up now through mixotrophy that was underappreciated before, dissolved organic matter, and eating bacteria. So one way that bacterial uh, uh, production ends up in the grazer chain is by bacteria actually being eaten by algae. And ciliates and large flagellates may be eaten by zooplankton. And so those really do link to some extent, this microbial loop to the grazer chain. And it, we can summarize this as saying, often that amount of linkage seems to be pretty small. There's conflicting tracer studies, and this is stuff that people are still working on, but maybe a fifth of the energy getting to higher trophic levels uh, from the, is from the micro, of the microbial loop is getting to higher trophic levels. Um, so not that much, but it can still be a significant amount in certain kinds of lakes with a lot of bacterial production. And we can also say that that classic view of bacteria as this benign sort of remineralizer that are um, breaking down organic material for the good of the lake or the good of the system is really 
absolutely not correct. That bacteria are competing with algae for nutrients and they're taking up those nutrients when they are decomposing material. They are not directly remineralizing nutrients to algae. Um, and so this whole competition between bacteria and algae is an important area of research. And that the microbial loop uh, heterotrophs, the grazers, those consumers in the microbial loops, the protozoans like the flagellates and the ciliates are really vital, as are the viruses, for remineralization. When the protozoans and the flagellates eat bacteria, they then, uh, they then excrete various materials into the, back into the water, and the viruses lyse all those bacterial cells, maybe 50% of them on average. And so that releases and remineralizes the, the material. And bacteria are super important in the lake in terms of mediating all of those redox reactions and chemical reactions and in decomposing dead material. So you can't ignore the microbes completely, even if you're a fisheries biologist, although you may not care that much about the small amount of supplementation of fish from the microbial loop. Although again, this number is really a little dodgy right now, and more studies come out every year to try to, try to predict which systems this should be more important source in. So this is where a lot of the active action is in aquatic food webs today, linking the bottom of the food, uh, the bottom of the lake with the, the pelagic zone of the lake and linking this microbial loop into the system. What's happening with all this dissolved organic material? What's really important in terms of bacteria and viruses? What's going on and how will all of the quantities of these various links between this tiny stuff that we tend not to think of very much when we're learning about ecology or if we're thinking about what's causing more fish production, how important is that to the rest of the system? So don't neglect the microbial loop. It's not just a source of potential patterns pathogens for organisms, that's a minor, minor part of its role. The microbial loop is a key uh, area of active research in aquatic systems, and the ability of us to integrate our understanding of microbial ecology with the rest of aquatic ecology is going to be vital to us understanding effects of of various perturbations on aquatic systems, like effects of temperature changes and effects of different types of acidity in systems. And so we'll keep trying to study and link these to other processes that you guys care about in terms of management issues and so forth in the future. So that's it for today. Thanks for joining us and uh, we'll continue on more in the future with other topics in the area of limnology.